worship leader. Uh, we are small in number this morning. Several of our 10 o'clock people were at the earlier service uh, because the youth uh, left uh, uh, to go to Kentucky, and so several of the parents of the youth were at that service. Um, and then also I know that uh, there were several that were out late at the ballpark last night. Uh, and it's good to see some of you uh, that made it uh, into church regardless. Um, a couple of uh, announcements. First of all, I always forget whenever I'm here, so I wanted to make sure I said it. Offering boxes are available at uh, both uh, exits, uh, so you can place your offering there as you, as you leave. Uh, we did uh, commission uh, 13 high school youth and four adult advisors uh, as they were uh, on their way departing uh, for the mission trip in Winchester, Kentucky. We keep those uh, folks in our prayers today. The last I had checked my son's GPS, they were somewhere between Dayton and Cincinnati. Uh, so we, uh, again, keep them in our prayers as they, as they travel and as they work uh, for God's glory uh, this week. I don't have uh, much else in the way of announcements. Uh, so let us now continue uh, to prepare our hearts and minds for worship in the playing of the prelude. The opening hymn is number 796, How Firm a Foundation. Please stand. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of the covenant, in our baptism you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. Give us the courage you gave the, the apostles 
that we may faithfully witness to your love and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. It's now time for Children's Church Noah's Park. Good morning. Good morning. Please read with me the prayer of illumination found in your bulletin. Before reading from the Bible, we seek the illumination of the Holy Spirit that we become receptive to the life-giving word which comes to us through both the reading and the proclamation of scripture. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read, and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first reading comes from the second chapter of Ezekiel. He said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Please read with me responsively Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of scorn to our ease, of the contempt of the proud. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand.
news according to Mark's Gospel, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no, br no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Word of God, word of life. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Stephen was a young man who felt the call of God on his life. He came from a really close family. He finished college and then went off to seminary, and after finishing seminary, he came back home before going to his first church. He visited with all his relatives for about a week, and he stopped by the church and talked to his hometown pastor. The pastor asked him if he would like to preach that upcoming Sunday. Stephen felt honored and took the pastor up on the invitation. Well, Sunday morning came, and after hours, yes, even days of preparation, he stepped up behind the pulpit. He looked out at the congregation of friends and relatives and started to expound the knowledge that he had learned. Well, he had hardly begun when his young niece, Kathleen, about six years old, stepped out into the aisle put her hands on her hips, her left foot out in front of the, other, of the other. She cocked her head to one side, and then she said in a very loud and clear voice for her age, Uncle Stephen, you don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know how Uncle Stephen finished that message, but undoubtedly it was an experience he will never forget. I don't remember anything happening like that my first time I preached at Trinity in Convoy, but, uh, but I have had it been interrupted by my own children over the years, so Xavier, don't get any ideas. You know, hold him down, Mom, if he uh, starts to jump up. It's hard to impress the people at home, isn't it? The whole world may be singing your praises, but at home folks see you as the shy kid with two left feet, or as the wild and crazy guy who was always in trouble. Jesus was enjoying unparalleled success all around Galilee. Large crowds were coming to hear him teach and to experience his own healing power, but it was time for a little R&R. &R. So he headed back to his hometown of Nazareth, accompanied by his disciples, and when Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? they asked. 
What's this wisdom that has been given him? And he even does miracles. But wait, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And Mark tells us they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he could not do any miracles there, Mark continues, except to lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Who was it that said, you can't go home again? I believe it was Thomas Wolfe. Wolfe, by the way, grew up in a large sprawling house at 48 Spruce Street in Asheville, North Carolina. He wrote about his growing up years there in a novel which he called Look Homeward Angel. So frank and realistic were his reminiscences that Look Homeward Angel was actually banned from Asheville's public library for seven years. Today, though, he is a favorite son, but for many years he was an embarrassment to many of the residents of that lovely southern city. Jesus was an embarrassment, not only to his hometown, but also to his family. Earlier in Mark's gospel, we read these mystifying words. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Think your family doesn't appreciate you? Welcome to the club. Jesus wasn't appreciated either. His own family thought he was out of his mind. After his death and resurrection, Jesus' mother and brothers were very active in the leadership of the church. But when Jesus first began his ministry, they were not what you would call supportive. I believe the fact, that fact may resonate with a few of you. Maybe you don't feel appreciated either. Maybe you don't feel appreciated at home. People there don't treat you with much respect. Maybe it's at school that you feel you don't get much respect or at work. Maybe it's here, maybe it's even here at church. Someone else gets to sing all the solos. Someone else gets all the recognition. It, it happens. Comedian Rodney Dangerfield made a career out of not getting any respect from his wife his kids, his parents. He said, I don't get any respect. My father carries around a picture of the kid who came with his wallet. It happens. In families, in communities, in the workplace, in churches, no respect. James S. Hewitt once gave an example of people not getting the respect they deserve, especially young people. He tells about his son who was using one of those super adhesive glues on a model airplane that he was building. In less than three minutes, said Hewitt, his right index finger was bonded to the shiny blue wing of his DC-10 and he tried to free it. He tugged at it, he pulled at it, he waved it frantically, but he just couldn't budge the finger free. Soon they located a solvent that did the job and ended that moment of crisis. But then James Hewitt writes this. Last night, I remembered that scene with my son and the model airplane when I visited a new family in our neighborhood. The father of the family introduced his children. This is Pete. He's the clumsy one of the lot. That's Kathy coming in with mud in our shoes. She's the sloppy one. And as always, Mike is last. He'll be late for his own funeral, I promise you. James Hewitt goes on to say, the dad did a thorough job of gluing his children to their faults and mistakes. And people do that to us all the time. They remind us of our failures, our errors, our sins, and they don't let us live them down. 
Like my son trying frantically to free his finger from the plane, there are people who try sometimes desperately to free themselves from their past. They would love a chance to begin again. When we won't let people forget their past, when we don't forgive, we glue them to their mistakes and refuse to see them as more than something that they have done. However, when we forgive, we gently pry the doer of the hurtful deed from the deed itself, and we say that the past is just that. It is the past. It's over and done with. Jesus obviously didn't have anything that needed forgiving, but the people in his community would not let him forget that he was the carpenter's son. In their minds, he was still one of the neighborhood brats, not somebody to be taken seriously. We don't understand that. Or we do understand that sometimes. What is it they say? A, an expert is someone who's more than 50 miles from home? The interesting thing is that Jesus could not do any miracles there, Mark continues, except to lay his hands on a few sick people and to heal them. Think about that. He could not do any miracles. Does that mean that when we don't take people seriously, when we don't give them the respect that they deserve, we may cripple their effectiveness? Of course it does. Some of you may remember the romantic story of Johnny Lingo. It was made into a motion picture years ago. Johnny Lingo lived in the South Pacific. The islanders all spoke highly of Johnny. He was strong, good-looking, very intelligent, but when it came for him to a time to find a wife, people shook their heads in disbelief. The woman that Johnny chose was plain, skinny. She walked with her shoulders hunched and her head down. She was very hesitant and shy. She was also a bit older than the other married women in the village, and though that had much to do with her value. But Johnny Lingo loved her. And what surprised everyone most was Johnny's offer. In order to obtain a wife, you paid her for her by giving her father cows. Four to six cows was considered a good price. The other villagers thought that he might pay two or even th three cows for this new bride at most. But he gave eight cows for her. And everybody chuckled about it since they believed his father-in-law had put one over on him. Some thought it was a mistake. Several months after the wedding, a visitor from the United States came to the islands to trade and heard the story of Johnny Lingo and his eight-cow wife. And upon meeting Johnny and his wife, the visitor was totally taken aback since this wasn't a shy, plain, hesitant woman at all, but one who was beautiful, poised, and confident. The visitor asked about the transformation. Johnny Lingo's response was very simple. I wanted an eight-cow woman, and when I paid that for her and treated her in that fashion, she began to believe that she was an eight-cow woman. She discovered that she was worth more than any other, other woman in the islands. And what matters most is what a woman thinks of herself. I wonder what might happen if more husbands started treating their wives like eight cow wives. How many husbands would, would ha what would happen if many wives started treating their husbands like eight cow husbands? Marcus Buckingham, senior vice president of Gallup organization and author of Now Discover Your Strength says that the number one sign of a healthy marriage is that spouses see each other more positively than other people do. And any time a partner esteems his or her spouse lower than outsiders do, it's a sign that there's trouble in the relationship. I wonder what might happen if more parents started treating their teenagers like eight cow teenagers. If more employers started treating their employees like eight cow employees. 
Even Jesus was affected by how the folks at home treated him. If that's true of Jesus, how much more is it true of the people with whom we interact every day? People around us crave to be treated with respect and dignity and love. I see families that are torn apart unnecessarily. All that is required is for family members to offer one another a little respect, to take one another seriously, to listen and show appreciation. So if you are one of those people that doesn't get much respect, remember Jesus. His own family and his own town could not see who he was, but of course that did not keep him from achieving his purpose in life. He was amazed at their lack of faith, but it did not slow him down. He knew who he was. He knew why he was here, to serve God, and he gave himself completely to the task at hand. Automobile pioneer Henry Ford once said something quite encouraging to those of us who may not feel appreciated. He was speaking of his car, the Model T, all of which were the same color and style His words still ring true. He said, all Fords are exactly alike, but no two people are just alike. Every new life is a new thing under the sun, and there has never been anything just like it before and never will be again. A young person ought to get that idea about themselves. They should look at the single spark of individuality that makes them different from other folks and develop that for all that they're worth. Society and schools may try to iron it out of them. Their tendency is to put us all into the same mold, but I say, don't let that spark be lost. It's the only real claim to importance. It's a good word for all of us. We may not be getting positive strokes at home that we feel we deserve, but that we need not keep us from being all that we can be. There's a man hanging on a cross who was rejected by his own family, his own town, his own people, but he saved the world. And he says to us, keep the faith You are a unique creation of the living God. Let no one tell you that you are of little worth. You are of ultimate value to my Father. You are so valuable that I died to save you. Let me tell you about a young man named Michael. Michael had real trouble accepting himself. He didn't get the respect that he needed at home. He never fit in with a particular group. He had trouble making friends. His self-esteem was in the basement. One day in high school, Michael recalls they looked in the mirror and he realized that he hated himself. He writes, that day I made a decision to just exist in life, just to get through it spend the rest of my time dreaming about a place where I was happy and popular and influential, but knowing that it would never come true. Michael's insecurity and emptiness stayed with him as he entered adulthood, but his whole life changed in a very short period of time when he attended a Billy Graham conference in Amsterdam. At the conference, Michael gained a new image of God, God as a loving father, as a creator who intended good for God's children. And after Michael gave his life to Jesus, he experienced the kind of love that he'd been hearing about. And as Michael grew in the faith, he also learned to like and to accept himself. He made friends more easily. Now that his self-esteem was Firmly rooted in his identity as a child of God, Michael became more confident and happier. Here is where true self-respect begins. 
It is when we realize that we are children of God. You are a child of God. It begins when we realize that Christ died offering acceptance and love and forgiveness. It begins when we hear the Master, who didn't receive any respect from his own people, say to us, your sense of identity comes from me. I respect you. I appreciate you. I died for you. I believe in you. I have a purpose for you. Believe in me and never question your self-worth again. Here's where it all begins. Like Michael, our lives can be turned around by trusting ourselves to Jesus so that we too might be sent into the world as his disciples were, be the hands and feet of Christ. Thanks be to God. We celebrate that uh, mission of being God's hands as we sing the hymn. It's on the uh, bulletin insert, God's work, our hands. Please stand. be seated. After uh, the responses uh, from some of the folks at 8 o'clock service, I asked Dee to share her musical message uh, with us at this service uh, this morning as well. I'm using this, Rex. Okay, good. All right. Um, when I prepared July's hymns and music, I really did not know what Sunday the kids were leaving on their mission trip. I, I had no idea. I just followed the readings for the day, especially the gospel. I followed the gospel today especially. And this one popped into my head. Um, again, it's one of those things that, you know, you play it long enough when you're younger, and it just, there it is all the time. And that's, it's called Send the Light. It was written by a guy named Charles Gabriel. You know at least two songs that he wrote. At least, well, one of two songs other than that. He wrote about 7,000, so. Uh, <laughs> but when he was in uh, San Francisco, he was a music director at Episcopalian Church. He wrote this for an Easter service. The other two that he wrote were His Eyes on the Sparrow, and he also wrote, um, and I always get this mixed up, I get the title mixed up all the time, so I'm gonna pause just a moment. Ah, to let the title come back. And it's, will the circle be unbroken? That's it. So I know you probably heard at least one of those two, maybe both of them. This is a third one then that you're hearing from Charles Gabriel. Um, it's a good old classic gospel hymn from the 1890s, and it goes something like this. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Good old gospel hymn. I mean, you can hear the piano already, right? Uh, 
Hear that? Going down there, he's going crazy. That's how my mother always played it anyway. And I'm not going to play it that way. I wanted to let you hear the words there, but I wanted to look at the words to two different verses, and so I'm going to sing this along with doing a little bit different, a little bit different rhythm to it. Send the light. There's a call comes ringing on a restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. And a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light and let its radiant beams light the world. ending because our work continues onward until he returns. Thank you, Dee. The Apostles' Creed is printed on page 105 in the front of your hymnal. Let us stand together and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's, God's only, only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In your bulletin, uh, you'll find uh, the piece uh, that we're going to be singing with the prayers, the Curie, at the bottom of page 3, number 155. Good and gracious God, you commissioned Ezekiel to speak to your people. Your son chose the twelve to spread the gospel. Give your spirit to the church, though, that speaks words of warning and grace to all people. 
Grant that many are brought to repentance, faith, and redemption in Christ Jesus. Thank you for calling this congregation into fellowship with your Son. Give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Make us disciples and heralds of your kingdom. Grant us courage to boldly share the good news. Give us kindness so that others may gladly hear it. We pray for the mission trip group on their way to Winchester, Kentucky for safe travel and meaningful experiences. You have given us this good land as our heritage. Let us always remember your generosity and do your will. Save us from violence, discord, confusion, and every evil course of action. Give us what outward prosperity may be your will, but above all things, give us faith in you that our nation may glorify your name and be a blessing to all peoples. Keep our military personnel and first responders in your care. Equip them to secure and further the blessings of peace, justice, and liberty. Help us to support and encourage the families, their families until they're reunited and heal all whose lives have been shattered by the violence of war in the Holy Land, Ukraine, Sudan, and throughout the world. St. Paul prayed that his thorn in the flesh might be removed. We pray for all who suffer. Heal them according to your will. Give them confidence in your grace, which is sufficient for their needs. We pray for Jean Goodwin, Katie Lindsay, Floyd Tyus, Monica Campbell, Bill Kill, A.J. Wiseman, Bonnie Taylor, John Meyer, Jared Fleming, Elizabeth, Stephanie, William, Vince Barnhart, and all those that we name aloud or in our hearts. Hear our prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. The Lord's Prayer is printed on page 112 in the front of your hymnal. Together we pray the words that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our sending hymn is number 546, To Be Your Presence. Mm -hmm. 